And if God was done with His church, the church wouldn't be here. Acts chapter number 26. We're going to read our text first. Stand when you find it. We're going to read verses 1 through 3, and then we're going to bump over to verse 24. Acts chapter number 26 and verse number 1. The Bible says, Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Thou art permitted to speak for thyself. Then Paul stretched forth the hand and answered for himself, I think myself happy, King Agrippa, because I shall answer for myself this day before before thee, touching all the things whereof I am accused of the Jews, especially because I know thee to be an expert in all customs and questions which are among the Jews, Which, wherefore I beseech ye, thee, to hear me patiently. Now let your eyes fall over on verse 24. Paul then goes in to preach a message. And then as he was preaching, in verse number 24, the Bible says, And as he thus spake for himself, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, thou art beside thyself. Much learning doth make thee mad. But he said, I am not mad, most noble Festus, but speak forth the words of truth and soberness. For the king knoweth of these things, before whom also I speak freely. For I am persuaded that none of these things are hidden from him, for this thing was not done in a corner. Let your eyes fall on verse number 27. King Agrippa, believest thou the prophets? I know that thou believest. Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Almost thou Persuadest me to be a Christian. Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Tonight I want to preach on this thought, Almost persuaded. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you so much for your family. Thank you so much for the family of God, that they can come together, worship in spirit and in truth. God, I pray now that you use me, that you fill me. God, that you get me out of your way. Let the cross... Be high and lifted up. May the name of Jesus be glorified. God, and if your children are here, God, I pray that you speak to them through your word. God, and if there's one here that's not a child of yours, if there's one here that's lost and doesn't know the free pardon of salvation, God, I pray that you save them tonight by your grace. And I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You can be seated. Paul is now appearing before King Agrippa. And it would be very tempting, church, to go ahead and tune me out right here. Why is that? Because we've been looking at the last few weeks on the series of messages on Christianity on trial. This will be the fifth message in the little mini-series, Christianity on Trial. And it seems like four weeks in a row, four messages in a row, Paul has had to stand trial for what he's been doing, for what he's been preaching. And each week, something different has been pulled out of Scripture. But it would be very tempting to say, oh, here we go again. They're going to get Paul in the judgment seat. and They're going to give Paul a chance to speak. And then nobody's going to know what to do. And then we're going to see it all happen again next week. But don't tune me out because something so big happens in this chapter, something so huge. We see King Agrippa enter the, uh, enter the equation. And we're going to look at verse number one. And we're going to kind of see the dialogue that takes place before Paul preaches a message here. If we look at verse number one, uh, we see, Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Thou art permitted to speak for thyself. Agrippa pushed the button that many people before him, many Romans before him, had pushed. He gave Paul the green light to open that mouth. He he gave Paul the green light to preach and to defend himself and to say what was going on. You see, Agrippa and Festus and all these Roman men of power had heard the Pharisees' side of the story. They'd heard the high priest's side of the story. They've heard uh, Ananias and all these... Men come and make accusation against Paul and throw stones against Paul. But now it would be Paul's turn yet again to open his mouth and to preach. And Agrippa did not realize the button he was pushing. Agrippa did not realize the green light that he was giving. But first, I want you to notice in verse number one, zero hesitation. Zero hesitation. Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Thou art permitted to speak for thyself. Then Paul prayed about it. No. Then Paul Googled it. Nope. Then Paul went to study. Nope. Then Paul went to the library. Nope. Then Paul phoned a friend. Nope. Then Paul called his dad. Nope. Then Paul called his mom. Thou art permitted to speak for thyself. Then Paul stretched forth his hand and answered for himself. And what were the first words out of his mouth? Zero hesitation here. Agrippa said, speak. Paul spoke. Agrippa said, you can speak for thyself. Paul did not hesitate. And Christian tonight, if given the opportunity to stand for your Lord and Savior, 
Peter and stand for what you believe in. We must not be hesitant. We, uh, so many times Christians get a platform and Christians get an opportunity and Christians get called by God to accomplish a mission or to go do work for the Lord. And the answer is always very simply, well, I'll pray about it or well, I'll think about it or well, I'll go talk to so-and-so or well, I'll call my pastor or well, I'll see. The Lord was very clear in His verbiage when He said, go ye into all the world and preach the Gospel to every creature. And He even gave the uh, apostles a promise that He would send forth a comforter and He would call in things unto remembrance the things which He had shown them. He's given us a promise that not only if we serve Him that He will take care of us, that He will make a way for us, He has also given us a promise that if we are willing to open our mouths for Him, He will give us the words to say. He will give us the things to preach. He will give us the, the opportunities to be a witness for Him. And there was zero hesitation here when Paul wanted to speak. There was zero hesitation. And don't get me wrong, church. I'm all for using resources. I'm all for study. That's, I believe that's necessary. I'm all for learning and reading books. And I'm all for uh, gaining knowledge and finding out why you believe and what you believe. And none of those things are bad. But sometimes God just needs somebody to say, I'll depend on you. I ain't got to call this person. I ain't got to call that person. I ain't got to pray about it. Lord, I know you want to use me. Lord, I know you've given me this opportunity. I'm not going to hesitate. I'm not going to take another opportunity. I'm not going to miss a chance to be used by you. There was zero hesitation here with Paul. Zero hesitation. Agrippa says, speak. Paul spoke. Not only zero hesitation, look at verse number two. Zealous happiness. Look at verse number two. I think, the Greek there means strong, authoritative. There was confidence in what Paul was saying. When Paul looked at Agrippa and his God-given eyeballs, and he said, I think... There was a confidence in his stature. There was a firmness in his speech. It wasn't, well, Agrippa, I think. You know, the words here would kind of get you to learn that. But if you go back and look at the Greek, there was a strong boldness in the way he began to speak. It was, <clears throat> it was affirmative. It was something that would <clears throat> uh, have authority behind it. And he looked at Agrippa and he said, I think, I know myself happy. Same word we could use to find the word blessed. You know what? After all the things Paul had gone through, there were many things Agrippa was probably getting ready to hear from Paul, wasn't there? After all the times Paul's been falsely accused and falsely imprisoned, and here he goes again on trial for something he didn't do, on trial for saying something that the Romans didn't understand, on trial for saying something that they killed Jesus for, on trial for something yet again. There were probably many things that Agrippa was waiting for Paul to say. He was probably waiting for him to do probably what you and I would do, to start throwing stones, to start complaining, to start whining and moaning and saying, please let me go. Why has this got to happen to me? Why are you picking on me, Mr. Roman King? But the first words out of Paul's mouth were, I am blessed. Can you imagine how taken back Agrippa was? He knew this man had every excuse, every right to be bitter. No doubt he had all the stenographers and the word takers ready to start writing down the list of complaints Paul had. Because he's being tried as a Roman citizen here. This King Agrippa would have had to make sure that he was doing his due diligence. But here we have Paul with his opening statement, I'm blessed. How many times have you ever heard that out of a defense attorney's mouth? Judge, jury, ladies and gentlemen, my client just wants to come forth today and just to declare that he is blessed. When have you ever heard that on Judge Judy? Hmm? Never. Never. But that's what we see here in the courtroom of Paul and Christianity on trial. The first words out of his mouth were zealous happiness. I think myself happy. I am blessed. I am empowered. I am a child of the King. I am saved. I'm going to heaven. I have eternal life. When you get to this point where you feel like the world's just picking on you and the world's just got it out for you and you're given the opportunity to stand and you're given the opportunity to speak, don't be one of them spineless little Christians that just complains about everything and the spineless little Christians that just moans about everything and the whole world's against you and nothing's your fault. Everything. I am blessed. You woke up this morning, you're blessed. You woke up in the United States of America this morning, you're blessed. You're blessed. I was talking with my grandmother today at lunch and she was telling me a story about an extended family member and he's having to uh, get in an ambulance because he keeps having heart attacks and strokes. He's a, he's a saved child of God. He wants to go home. He wants to go home. He's in his 90s, but he, he keeps having these strokes and these heart attacks and he keeps having to get in these ambulance rides. And 
he's having to get taken. And they keep taking him to a hospital he doesn't want to go to. He wants to, and it's a long, drawn-out story. But the moral of the story is, I said, well, at least he can call a number and be in a hospital. She said, what do you mean? And I said, an ambulance in the United States of America is more readily equipped and monetarily equipped and medically equipped than an entire hospital where I've been in Nicaragua. One ambulance has more equipment, more life-saving technology, more life-saving resources than hospitals in other parts of the country. Don't be the one. Don't be the child of God that will wake up on your not soft enough pillow, drink your not hot enough coffee, go in your not nice enough car, arrive to your not good enough job, and complain about all that God has given you. Paul, in this moment, in this time, when given the opportunity, he opens with the words, I am blessed. We can't miss that, church. Zealous happiness. Zealous happiness. Not just zero hesitation, zealous happiness, but zooming homiletics, preaching. Look at verse number three. Especially because I know thee to be expert in all, quest in all customs and questions which are among the Jews. Wherefore, I beseech thee, I need you to hear me patiently. Paul, once again, took full advantage. He said, King Agrippa, I'm blessed, but not only because of how good God's been to me, but because of how God's been good to you. To give you one more opportunity, King Agrippa, to hear this message. Because you know the manners and the customs of the Jews, Agrippa, and you know why I'm blessed. And you know, and we're going to get to why I knew here in a little bit later, but you know what's going on here. And you know that you woke up this morning too, King Agrippa. And you know you have a reason to be blessed, King Agrippa. And you know that there's something that I'm about to tell you that you've heard before, maybe secondhand, maybe through the grapevine. But you know that there's some good news that I'm about to proclaim to you. And we have to notice and we have to understand that from verse 3 to verse 23, Paul preaches a message. Paul preaches a message. He begins to expound. He begins to exhort. What does he not do? He does not throw stones. He does not use foul language or call names. He did not testify of the works of the Pharisees. He did not get up and start to list all their faults and all their failures. No. Here we go again. Paul gets the opportunity to preach. And he's in a court of law. He's in a Roman sentencing. He's in a Roman hearing before the king over this province. And he doesn't take this opportunity to defend him. He doesn't take this opportunity to attack them. He takes this opportunity. He clears himself off a spot to proclaim how great the God of heaven is. And if you'll look at verses 3, verse 23 on your own time and just really dive in. So once again, he's taking the time to explain and to expound not great theological knowledge, not in-depth, crazy, out-there ways of thinking. He's not trying to outsmart the Romans here. He's not trying to outsmart the Pharisees here. He's simply repeating his own testimony. His own testimony. Listen up, all of us Facebook warriors and all of us social media warriors and all of us Fox News correspondents and CNN correspondents and all of us who now in 2020 have become political analysts and have become uh, these data collectors and have become doctors over coronavirus and all the things that we wish we knew. Paul has something so big to teach us here. When given this platform, when given this opportunity to defend himself, he did not waste time in the world's wisdom. He did not waste time in the arguments of men and the arguments of wisdom. He simply began to once again declare Declare his testimony about the day God found him, about the day God saved him, about how God had kept him through all these years of ministry, about God, how God had called him to do great and mighty things, and how Paul was not slack concerning the promises of God, and how Paul was not slack to obey the calling of God. And he simply finished with the thoughts of, I have obeyed my Lord and my Savior in preaching the gospel unto this day. Can you say that? Can you say that? I know I can't. I can't say I haven't gotten in the flesh and fought fire with fire. When they throw this accusation at Christ, I want to throw this accusation at them. Don't we get that way? I know I have. When they have their deductive reasoning and their stance and their thoughts, sometimes we want to get in our reasoning and our stance and our thoughts. God never called you to do that, did He? He never called me to do that. He did not call us to attack sinners. He died for sinners. He did not call us to... Fight with the lost. 
He died for the lost. He did not call us to be mean to people. He called us to love people. But you don't understand what they're doing, preacher. You don't understand what they're saying, preacher. You don't understand. When He was on the cross, they were on His mind. When He hung on that cross and bled for you and me, He was bleeding for them too. Are you loving Him? Are you telling the love of Jesus? Now, the big, the big question is, did it work? Paul gives us, from verse 3 to 23, a great message, a great personal testimony, a great truth, a great presentation of the gospel. Did it work? Well, we have to understand, first of all, that it wasn't up to Paul if it worked or not. Paul knew, as we know, we are called to preach the gospel, to teach all nations, to be a witness unto every creature. We are not responsible. We cannot be responsible for the supernatural harvest. We cannot be responsible for what the seed does once it's planted. He takes care of that, doesn't he? He adds the conviction. The Holy Ghost adds the drawing power. And it is up to the free will of God's created child to decide whether or not if they accept it or not. But here we would have something very big, some very scary words uttered by King Agrippa. I want your eyes to fall back on verse number 24. And as he thus spake for himself, Festus interrupted. Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, thou art beside thyself. Much learning doth make thee mad. All right? But the gospel is to them that perish foolishness. This is what we're seeing live and in action. But he said, I am not mad. Notice how respectful he is here. Most noble Festus. But speak forth the words of truth and soberness. For the king knoweth of these things, before whom also I speak freely. For I am persuaded that none of these things are hidden from him, for this thing was not done in a corner. King Agrippa, he calls him by name, believest thou the prophets? I know that thou believest. Then Agrippa said unto Paul, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Do you realize those are the scariest words we've read in the book of Acts? All the other times the gospel's been presented. We've seen acceptors of the gospel, and we've seen rejectors of the gospel. But here we'd find Agrippa on very dangerous ground. This ground of almost. This ground of, I hear what you're saying, but I'm just not quite, I'm not there. Did you know there is no almost with God? Did you know that there is no almost saved? Did you know that there is no almost persuaded? Yet we know, maybe people in this church, maybe people in our workplaces, maybe people at our schools, maybe people we come into contact with, maybe people in our neighborhood, we know a lot of Christians, but could they possibly be an almost Christian? Could you possibly be an almost Christian? You've checked all the right boxes. I know I'm preaching to the church on Sunday night. This is what God told me to preach. I, you've checked all the right boxes. You've come to all the right things. You've wore all the right clothes according to your peers, according to your brethren, according to your family. And you might be guilty of being like Agrippa and being almost persuaded. If you hear nothing else I say for the rest of the night, almost will not cut it with God. It'll cut it with me. You can fool me. You can fool the church. You can fool the fellowship. You can fool your family. You can fool your mama. You can fool your daddy. You can fool your brother. You fool your sister. You fool your kids. But you can't fool him. Almost Christians. How did King Agrippa wind up being an almost Christian? That's what we're going to look at tonight. Because I just don't want to beat people up over the head. I want to show them. I want to help them. I want to show you how you might identify some almost Christians out there. And I don't want you to identify them so you can go tell them they're going to hell. No, I want, you to, I want you to identify them so you can begin to pray for them. So you can begin to be an effective witness to that person. So you can begin to explain to them why it is, like Paul did, your personal testimony and how you know you're going to heaven and how you know you got saved and how you know your Lord and Savior. It is important for us to understand that if we have friends and family members that we're inviting to church because we know that they'll be okay in church or they may like church or they may like enjoying church or coming to church, but we have to look deeper than that. As children of the King, we have to understand are they saved or are they not? We can't be satisfied with almost because you won't be able to talk and real Christian out of service. 
you won't be able to argue. that They'll be so on fire for God. They'll have such a heart and a zeal for souls. Everybody's called to do different things and serve in different capacities and different avenues, but a Christian wants to be like Christ. An almost Christian just wants to fill the part. Just wants to check the box. So tonight, almost Christians, number one, they discount the Bible. Look at verse number 27. King Agrippa, believest thou the prophets? I know that thou believest. King Agrippa, believest thou the prophets? Greek word here for prophets is the word that translates as inspired speakers. Inspired by who? God. For all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. And we know that the question Paul was posing here to King Agrippa, who had an understanding of the book of the laws and had an understanding of the prophets and had an understanding of Jewish manners and customs. How did he know? We'll get to that in just a second. But he had an understanding of these things. He said, do you believe the book? Do you believe what the prophets have said about Jesus? Because if you know that the prophets said it thousands of years ago, and I'm saying it now, and I didn't know them, and they didn't know me, that there's no way this could be true unless God is real, unless the gospel is real, unless the book is real. Number one, it was a prophetical book. 6,000 years of authorship, 66 books, 783,137 words, 40 authors, 31,102 verses, 40 generations, and every single page proclaims Jesus Christ. It's a prophetical book. It's a book that they've been trying for 2,020 years since its completion to discredit. Scholars from all over the world have put their intellects and have put their educations to the test, trying their hardest to discredit that Bible. Because they know if they can discredit the Word of God, one jot, one tittle, if they can discredit one sequence of Scripture, the rest of it we would have to accept as null and void because God says His Word is perfect. God says there is no error in His Word. God said it was inspired by Him. And if there was a mistake in them, it would be to admit that God made a mistake. But it's a prophetical book. God gave men utterance. God moved men by His Word and by His Holy Spirit to write the things that He would have them to write hundreds of years before these events would happen. Hundreds of years before Christ would be born. Hundreds of years before these messianic prophecies would be fulfilled. These men begin to write. Daniel begin to write. Jeremiah begin to write. Isaiah begin to write. There is absolutely no way they could have done that unless God is real. King Agrippa, you've heard this before. Don't you believe the prophets? King Agrippa, you know what I'm saying is the truth. You know they said it hundreds of years ago. Do you believe your Bible? It's a prophetical book. Prophetical book, but it's a powerful book. Raise your hand. And I really want you to raise your hand. If you were saved, oh, sorry, there's a question following. Brother Dan's so obedient. If you came to know Christ because you heard one verse of Scripture, whether by preaching, whether by a gospel tract, whether by a witness, you heard one verse of Scripture. I did. I was in a home Bible study with that family right up there. One verse of Scripture changed my life. Introduced me to the Savior. Introduced me to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. One chapter in the book of Proverbs. One verse in the book of Proverbs. I was eight years old. Do I remember exactly what it said? Heavens no. But it was enough. It was enough to get me questioning. To get me wondering. To get me searching. And the Holy Spirit was right there drawn. It's a powerful book. It can change life. One verse can change lives. If we could see the records. If we could peer into the Lamb's book of life. Our little tiny human brains would not be able to comprehend the numbers that have read John 3.16 and accepted the Lord Jesus Christ. Have read Romans 3.23, Romans 5.8, Romans 10.13, and they've read, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And they've trusted in that promise alone right there where they're at. Maybe they read it in a different language, brother. Maybe they read it in Spanish. Maybe they had it translated to them. Maybe they had no idea even how to read, but the Holy Spirit Himself. I met a preacher down in Nicaragua. He had nobody to witness to him. He had no Bible to be read to him. But Pastor Martin down in Nicaragua, he remembers the day God directly spoke to him. God 
directly gave him Scripture and he was able to take that Scripture and go find out what it meant. And through that, he was able to come to the saving knowledge of salvation through Jesus Christ. With one verse, it is a powerful book. It's a powerful book. Not just a powerful book, but it's a potent book. Here's what Paul was asking. Agrippa, believest thou the prophets? Because if it's true, man has a serious problem. If the Bible is true, man has a serious problem. What problem is that? For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That there's nothing you can do and there's nothing I can do. Do you believe this, King Agrippa? Do you believe this? Fill your name in here. Do you believe your Bible? You see, almost Christians, they have to discount the Bible. They have to say, well, you know, God, I'm sure God had good intentions, but man wrote it and man makes all kinds of mistakes, so I just don't believe it. I'm going to discredit it altogether. Or they say, well, you know, there's just so many things that could have got lost in translation and there's just so many things that could have got lost and there's just so much. What, 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 if, what if this was all just a conspiracy theory and we got a page of it and we've made so... Friend, 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 millions of dollars, millions of points on the IQ scale have went in to try to discredit this book and they can't do it. It's a potent book. It's true. And that means we have a problem that Jesus had to solve. And that's what Agrippa was coming to face to face with. You see, almost Christians, they get face to face with accepting the Bible is real and that it's true or they have to discount it. They can't prove it's not true. They can't prove it's not real. They just have to Almost pretend like it's not even there. We've got a coworker, Jacob and I, that he always likes to argue. He's an agnostic. He doesn't believe in the Christian story of salvation. And Jacob says, well, why? he says this and this. Why don't you argue with him? I said, Jacob, if a lost person doesn't believe, which they won't, that the Word of God is the Word of God, then I cannot take my arguments and give him truth out of the Word of God because he doesn't believe it's the Word of God. That's the first step that they have to discount is their Bible. Jesus said this kind comes by prayer and fasting. The Holy Spirit's got to work on that man. All I can do is be Christ to him. Show him the love of Christ. Show him the grace of God. Tell him I'm praying for him. Be consistent in his life. Almost Christians discount the Bible. Number two, almost Christians disgrace their birthright. Look at verse 26. For the king knoweth of these things before whom I also speak freely. For I am persuaded that none of these things are hidden from him. For this thing was not done in a corner. What's Paul talking about here? Flip back over to Acts chapter number 12 and verse number 20. Acts chapter 12 and verse number 20. Who's Paul talking to? King who? Agrippa, right? King Agrippa. And he's talking to him in Acts 26. But we'll find over... In Acts chapter number 12, in verse number 20. And we're going to read about King Herod. How many of you remember the day that Herod came in and he killed James, the brother of John, and he took Peter and he arrested him. He bound him in chains and cast him into prison. You all remember that message? And we remember that the church got on their knees and prayed and Peter was freed from prison by an angel of the Lord and he came back to the church. And next we find King Herod, the same man that persecuted the church, here in verse number 20, and the Bible says, And Herod was highly displeased with them a Tyre of Sidon, but they came with one accord to him, and having made Blastus, the king's chamberlain, their friend, desired peace because their country was nourished by the king's country. And upon a set day, Herod, arrayed in royal apparel, sat upon his throne and made oration to them. And the people gave a shout, saying, It is the voice of a God and not of a man. And immediately the angel of the Lord smote him, because he gave not God the glory, and he was eaten of worms, and gave up the ghost. Now who is this? King Herod? Right? Chapter 12. Who are we talking about in Acts 26? King Agrippa? King Herod in Acts chapter 12, best I can tell through historical study and biblical study, was King Herod Agrippa the first that was eaten of worms here in Acts chapter 12. King Agrippa that we're dealing with in chapter number 26 was King Herod Agrippa the second. So when Paul looks at this man and says, 
You know what I'm talking about. Look at back at verse number 26. For the king knoweth of these things before whom also I speak freely. For I am persuaded that none of these things are hidden from him. For this thing was not done in a corner. And no doubt he made eye contact with that king. And he looked at him and his God-given eyeballs and said, You remember your daddy? You remember what your daddy did to a man like me? You remember what he did to James? You remember what he did to Peter? Do you remember what God did to him? No doubt, fear probably shot through a grip at this time. Convicting power probably shot right through him. His daddy chose the route of sin. His daddy chose the route of fame and power and men's praise. And here Agrippa is, fulfilling his daddy's very footsteps as the next king in line. And he gets to look at Paul here, as his dad looked upon Peter and James. And he gets to look at Paul and he gets to wield the same authority and wield the same power. And he's got a decision to make. Will I do what my earthly father did? Or will I look to my heavenly father? Will I fall into the same pitfalls and the same failures of sin as my heavenly father did? Or will I look for something bigger? Will I look for something better? I know what this man is saying has power to it. I watched my dad be eaten of worms and given up the ghost. I heard how he persecuted these Christians and I heard what happened to him. Will I make the same decision? How many would have to say that Agrippa II here would have to be a fool to follow in his daddy's footsteps? I would. You'd have to be a fool to watch sin wreck your daddy's life, wreck your mama's life, wreck your family member's life and choose it anyway. But almost Christians do that. Almost Christians get to the point where they have to choose between their earthly father, their father the devil, or their heavenly father. And they have to choose if they're going to keep walking in the lust of their flesh, the lust of their eyes, and the pride of life. Or if they're going to forsake that, repent, and put their faith and trust in Jesus. They have to make that decision. So notice how huge it is here. And this was the turning point for Agrippa when Paul looked at him and said, you know what I'm talking about. This thing wasn't done in a corner. He was saying, your dad tried to stop this. Are you going to make the same mistakes? He did. Agrippa did not have to go down his daddy's path. He could have had a brand new father right then and there, couldn't he? He could have had a brand new dad right there, couldn't he? If you know an almost Christian, sometimes I might just need to hear, I know you've not had the best family. I know you come from a long line of sinners. So do I. You know why? Because all of us come from people. People are sinners. But you could have a brand new dad. You could have a brand new relationship with a father that loves you. Agrippa, you don't have to be like your dad. Church, pray for me. I'm about to go back into the trenches on Wednesday. Getting to be in here on Sundays and Wednesdays is a blessing. Is a blessing. I'm dealing with a majority crowd that reads their Bible, that prays, that knows the Lord, that if all the preachers were to go away and be gone forever, you guys would still have a relationship from the Lord. But I'm about to go in with a crowd, as little as they may be, that is more intimidating to preach to than an army of preachers. Why? Because they've spent their time on the Internet all week. They've spent their time listening to the worst kind of music you can possibly conceive all week long. They've spent their time doing the things that are unpleasing in the sight of God. And they've spent their time feeding that outer man and feeding that flesh and feeding the lust of this world and feeling the, feeding the lust of the flesh. These young people that I'm about to go preach to, they spend weeks after weeks watching mamas on drugs and daddies on drugs, just like Agrippa did. He watched a daddy serve sin. That's what these teenagers are doing. And God's called me to go into the places where they have no mama and they have no daddy and there's no one speaking the truth and there's no one proclaiming God's Word. That's why I'm so thankful for these godly grandparents that'll say, hey, I know this mama and daddy's messed up. I know they're not living right, but I'm going to go in and intercede on behalf of them grandbabies. I'm going to bring them to church. I'm going to tell them about God. I'm going to tell them what it means to pray. I'm going to tell them what it means to serve the Lord. I thank God for some godly grandmamas and some godly daddies, but some of these kids don't even have that. They're just like Agrippa. They had a wicked daddy. They had a wicked mama. And I would be willing to stand every Wednesday night and say, just like Paul did, you don't have to be like your earthly daddy. You don't have to be like your earthly mama. There's a God in heaven that loves you. So whether I have five out there on Wednesday night or 500... Church, I need you praying for them. 
Because yes, they might come in here for a hot dog, right, Jacob? They might come in here for a granola bar. They might come in here to play kickball. But my sincere prayer is that they run headfirst into the cross of Calvary and meet Jesus. That was Paul's desire here. Agrippa, you know, you know, almost Christians discount the Bible. Almost Christians disgrace their birthright. Almost Christians discredit believers. Look at verse number 25. But he said, I am not mad, most noble Festus, but speak forth the words of truth and soberness. Look back at verse number 29 after he deals with Agrippa. And Paul said, I would to God that not only thou, but also all that hear me this day were both almost and altogether such as I am, except these bonds. You know what Paul was saying? I wish everybody that could hear my voice could have what I have. I don't want to hold it. I don't want to harbor it. I don't want to hog it. I want everybody to know Jesus. I want everybody to know Jesus. You see, but almost Christians, they can get away with discounting the Bible now in 2020 because there's just so much muck and so much mud and so much philosophy and so much wisdom out there. They can just kind of lump it all in. And they can discredit their, you know, family by their birthright, their, their, their sinful nature by saying, well, I'm just free to determine the truth for myself and, I don't, and I, I'm just going to make my own decisions and you can't tell me how to live and I'm going to do what I... So they can do those first two steps rather easily. But this is where it's up to us and we get the control of the cards on how hard it's going to be to do this last part. You see, their last defense, their last hope in holding out and remaining lost and holding out and being an almost Christian is by discrediting believers. You know what they had to do? They had to say, this guy's crazy. We can't believe a word that's coming out of his mouth. But deep down, Agrippa knew what he was saying was true. And when your coworker, when your son, when your daughter, when your husband, when your wife sees you and the consistency in your life and sees the consistency in your prayer life and sees the consistency in your Bible study and sees the consistency in your walk with Christ, they cannot discredit it. They cannot whisk it away. You see, the believer proves the blood. The believer proves that the blood of Calvary can change and save to the uttermost. You show me a man that was wretched at one point, but meets Jesus head on and is washed by the blood, I'll show you a brand new man. The world cannot explain that. The world has no answer for that. But you see, a believer that is washed in the blood has more power, has more light. That's why in Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, He said, be a light, be salt. It's up to you. I leave you here. I go to prepare a place for you. But until I come, be about my Father's business. Go and preach and teach all nations. It is up to you. I'll be with you whithersoever thou goest. I'll give you the power. I'll give you the words to say. I'll give you the opportunity. But look how the, much the power, the, how much power the believer has. The, the believer proves the blood. The believer provides boldness. And the believer provokes the bitterness. You know what will change a sinner's heart towards God faster than anything? Is a Christian loving on him. Is a Christian that has every right to be mad or bitter at that person. But instead, they just come and wrap their arms around and say, Hey, just want you to know I'm here for you. I love you. I'm praying for you. That's how much power a believer has. That's how much power the boldness of a believer has. Church, as Miss Joy comes, you don't have to settle for almost. Agrippa settled for almost. He got his brethren, his Roman brethren up there together, and they said, this man's not guilty of anything, but I guess we'll send him to Caesar. That's where he wants to go. They discredited him. They said, I was almost persuaded. I almost bought it. But here's what they were really saying. I reject it. I don't want it. But church, the Lord's put it on my heart tonight that there's some saved children of the King in this room without a shadow of a doubt. But I would say in a crowd this size, there's a very, very good chance that while you're saved, you're going to heaven, your sins are forgiven, you're not 100% sold out.